director, Sarah Thomas, Nettie Dog, uh, standing by. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Buenas. Good morning. Good morning, Sabrina. Nice to uh, reconnect with you all. Hope all is well down there at KUAM. We're doing all right. How about you? Good, good. Lots of stuff to do, certainly. Certainly lots of work always, but very good. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, heard that the uh, new homeless shelter is going to be right around the old Blockbuster in uh, Timuning, and I think the last time we spoke there, you said something about they needed, like, flood insurance. So c could we just start there with a status update on the opening of the second homeless shelter? Yes. That Now, the second homeless shelter is a project that Gura is is uh, working with Catholic Social Services on. So we're also trying to, you know, stay close to them and get briefed. Uh, so that's what, you know, as you said, they're still working on flood insurance and getting it going. And so we'll see what happens. And, you know, we were hoping that something would happen in this last couple of weeks, but nothing has uh, moved forward as far as I know of. So let's see. I have a meeting with uh, with the Gora director today, and I hope that what will happen afterwards, you'll see some uh, some media releases or updates that uh, we'll make. I'll let you guys know mm -hmm. uh, what those updates are. So yeah, we're we're uh, trying to get behind that, and as you know, there's also a, a Department of Interior grant for an emergent permanent emergency shelter that's being worked on as well. So there's, uh, excuse me, there's uh, there's things going on to, to ensure that our people do have uh, shelter available uh, should that be a need, a continued need, and it looks like there will be. So uh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing that we have that available, you know. So that's where we're at with those two, those two, uh, the Department of Interior and the uh, the one down in um, the second shelter down in Tumani. Mm -hmm. right. Where would the where are you guys looking for the um, the uh, permanent emergency shelter to be located? I don't know that yet. It's going to be a purchase, and so I think that's still in the process right now, mm -hmm. uh, putting that out and and uh, making sure that it. You know, prayfully, that will be tied up by the end of this fiscal year, September 30th. Mm -hmm. uh, the procurement and the the final the final steps that it takes uh, to get a building procured will be done. You know, these things take a long time and not as quick as as we would all like it to be. So uh, my understanding is that that's uh, being targeted for the end of September. And so I think there's still a couple of places that are being looked at mm -hmm. uh, in central Guam uh, for the uh, permanent emergency shelter funded by Department of in, uh, Interior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what about the, um, I know I keep asking this, but I'm, I'm just not really clear. The emergency shelter that's up in Mighty, does that close if the emergency declaration is lifted, the, the public health emergency? As long as there are people there that are not housed, uh, we cannot just take them and, you know, put them back out in the streets. And as you know, the the families that are there, the priority are families, uh, folks that are that have children. The last couple of weeks has really been intense because school has started, right? Mm -hmm. So we've done as you know, I think a really good job in trying to get the kids back into school. That's you know one of the the downsides or one of the the unfortunate things that happen when uh, children are homeless as they get bounced around from school to school and you know there isn't really isn't the stability and that's very very hard for them not only with their uh, to stabilize their their education and their learning but also in developing their relationships with their peers and you know of course their teachers so the whole idea of you know kids going from school to school is probably, you know, one of the biggest travesties of being homeless as a child. Uh, so we we really, the last couple of weeks have been focused on trying to get them either back 
uh, back in their neighborhoods um, or getting them into schools that they're familiar with that they are likely to move back to. So uh, there have been about, I understand four or five families that have left there. You might uh, remember there's 39 rooms there and 39 rooms of anywhere from 150 to 170 people in those those rooms. So that means that there's you know approximately four to six people in a room. Mm -hmm. That's not the best environment for anybody at any point, you know? So getting them into permanent housing has been a real challenge for the last month. And uh, we've had some that have been able to, uh, as I said earlier, uh, return home or return to the community where their children can go to schools that they're familiar with. Uh, for the most part, um, the kids are at schools surrounding um, global dorms in that vicinity right now. And um, they, are, they are attending school. We go there every day for the last couple of weeks. The whole, you know, again, mission was getting the kids back, the, the school age students back into school and trying to stabilize, you know, where, you know, their living environment. And emergency shelters are generally designed for a short stay, maybe 30, 60, 90 days. And some folks have not been able to return home for many reasons. And those are the reasons, those reasons that they have shared with us are the ones that we're trying to help them resolve so that they can get a new place to live or go back to where they came from if it's suitable. Uh, many are in unsafe housing. Um, and as reported, they have been, some of them have been in uh, very um, crowded homes and there are others that were not allowed to live in our housing area because of non-compliance. So those are several of the reasons that we have found out um, uh, explains why they're at, they're at global dorms right now. So again, the last couple of weeks has really been focused on, on the kids and what's, what's the best situation for them given um, their their living um, environment you know their their living situation uh, it's been it's been a tough couple of weeks but you know I think we're feeling really good because all the kids are in school that's that's like a big win you know they're all back in school and um, you know helping them you know navigate their way so to speak in the next few months. Yeah. And uh, prayfully, it's going to be sooner than that. So we're, we're, yeah, go ahead. I wanted to ask, um, because, uh, and I don't know if this is like anecdotally, but you mentioned people who are no longer in the shelter because of noncompliance, right? So I get a lot of no, that. No, no, I'm saying they were, in, they're at the shelter because they were asked to leave their homes because uh, of noncompliance. Okay. So what about those yeah, people who are, who are or any other you know place that they might have been at right what about those people who have been asked to leave the shelter because of non-compliance uh like i was saying i get a lot of messages from people who uh were i mean they say they were kicked out and you kind of see them like uh especially up here in Harmon, there's been a big migration uh, north from from a lot of people who i used to see down in agatnia so i mean is, when you talk about you know ending homelessness addressing it how do you address um, that segment of the homeless population that, you know, doesn't want to comply or for whatever reason uh, can't go back to these shelters that we're opening. Right. You know, Chris, that's that's really such a, a, a very complex, complex, you explained it very well. And I know that to be true because I have also observed uh, damage to the current global dorms, you know, where doors, walls, closets have gotten kicked in and, you know, things have been damaged and, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's just crazy. It's just unfortunate. 
But I, I will tell you, you know, the the issues that present, uh, you know, seem to be consistent. There's untreated behavioral health issues. There's uh, uh, substance abuse issues. There's uh, dis disunity with the families and uh, with the current situation of, of the socioeconomic environment where people are getting reduced or or um, reduced or have lost reduced hours at work or lost their jobs that's another driving uh, force I think for homelessness but most of the folks that we have seen thus far really fall into the three categories and that is uh, untreated behavioral health issues uh, and substance abuse issues and I'll tell you uh, the the uh, nonprofits and the uh, government agencies who are aligned with these issues, responding to these issues, have done things that, you know, maybe perhaps can be described as non-traditional. In other words, they're out in the streets now. We're, we're going as teams. We put together a multidisciplinary team that is comprised of all the different key entities, and we're going through those cases including the ones that are, are singles. Yeah. What sort of uh, services um, is mental health providing to the individuals that are in the homeless shelter that are um, suffering from mental health uh, issues, substance abuse issues? Well, first of all, they, uh, they participate. When, when there's a new family that's there, they are called to do an evaluation. And then after the evaluation is done and the plan is put together, they sit down with these folks and um, offer these services to them. Now, it's always gonna be, it's always gonna be voluntary, right? They're going to have to consent to participate in individual or group counseling or, or whatever is being recommended, including, you know, detox, um, and treatment, uh, drug and alcohol treatment. And some do not opt to participate. That's the hard part. But, you know, I've always, um, I've always said, don't give up the struggle to struggle. In other words, you go back because every day is a new day and something might push them to the point where they're at a greater uh, level of readiness. And that's what has to happen. They have to, you know, when when you have an issue with drug and alcohol, if you have a behavioral health issue that's been untreated, you have to come to that point of readiness where you, you can't be, it's very, very hard, you know, someone's going to be forced to unless they're determined to be incompetent. Mm -hmm. And until uh, they are declared incompetent by a court, they have the right to do, you know, decide when they will participate in services. So it's a constant uh, uh, educational and supportive environment that has to be provided to, mm -hmm. to help them to get there. And uh, one of the uh, awesome things that have also occurred is our meetings with uh, leaders from the, uh, from the FSM, because we do have a good representation of folks uh, from the FSM, the Federated States of Micronesia, and they're going to be part of the team to help uh, talk to and encourage and support uh, the folks there to get into a supportive or service uh, treatment program. So, you know, uh, there is there is no uh, shortage of, of folks out there that want to help. Uh, I feel very encouraged by it because uh, we all understand there's a problem and, and it's not an easy one to solve. It's not like just getting them a house and putting them in there. That's that's one small part of it, really. It's the bigger part is sustaining that home and providing a positive environment for the people that live there, especially the kids. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, basically that's the approach that we're using. It's a good question, Sabrina.
H- how many families then has, um, you know, because when they go in the shelter, there's all these wraparound services that are supposed to be provided. So how many families have been able to transition to a more permanent um, housing? Right now, um, that's been slow. And um, I think I think from um, the other day, the last report was maybe about uh, five of those five of those families and and there are people that are parked outside waiting to get in too you know that it's just so there's there's several families that are also uh staying in the cars outside and waiting to get in uh to global so you know there's going to be at least from what we see right now until we can uh, get them back home or into a permanent home uh, that they, they can sustain. That's the key. You all might have heard that uh, Guam Housing Urban Renewal Authority, Gura, has um, received permanent vouchers. Mm-hmm. Have you heard that? One? Yes, yeah, we had Ray on about that. Okay, so he shared with you these seven, 87 vouchers are permanent housing vouchers. Did that you guys talk about that? I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And what that means is once a, a person or a family has deemed to be eligible for those vouchers, it's one that's permanent. That means that that's, that's theirs forevermore. And once they, uh, if, if they get kicked out of that program or uh, whatever, something happens and they are not able to sustain that permanent housing, that voucher is lost forever it doesn't go to another family it's lost so it's really important that the eligibility and the support be provided to that family so that they can sustain uh, that permanent housing voucher so that's another area that we're working on uh, in our multidisciplinary team and with Gora is to ensure that they have the support that they need to sustain and to keep that permanent housing voucher do you know if any of those vouchers have been given out already? I'm not sure, but um, prayfully it'll be it'll be done this week or next week because again, the idea is to get everybody at home safe in a safe home, especially uh, those with children. That's that's kind of our priority right now. So I can get back to you next week and give you a status report on that as well, because what what I do know has happened is they've been divvied up to the various entities like uh, the Department of Individuals Integrated Services for Individuals with Disabilities known as DISID and of course the Department of Public Health and Social Services Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. So uh, these agencies have been allocated a certain number and that was for their their chronic uh, chronically homeless um, clients, so people are working to to get to them, to do the interviews, to the, do the eligibility ter- determinations, and to get them and uh, find them and get them into permanent housing. There have been other things that have come up, like some people can be in a in a permanent housing, but they need a personal care attendant. We're trying to unravel that because some people can't live by themselves. All even though they have one, the probability of them living by themselves uh, is is um, is not likely. And uh, because there, it takes time to reconnect them with their families and get them stabilized in their behavioral health or their substance abuse issues, and do the reunification with family and friends that that's that's a process it takes time and uh, to help be supportive of that person but um, the focus is there the ideas and plans to stabilize and ensure that they you know that they can sustain these housing vouchers are are in place all right well thank you so much sarah uh for the update yeah a lot of info there appreciate <laughs> it a lot of work okay Let's stay um, hopeful, you know, and keep the faith because there's some movement. And these are, you know, as you all know, these are families that have been there for a long time, have had struggles and problems. So 
We're doing what we can to, to move it. And uh, please, you guys have access to my personal uh, contact info. When you hear stories, uh, when people tell you that they're out in the streets or whatever, and I say this to the listening public too, you know, do what you can to keep your families at home. You need support because you have identified that there are things about them that uh, are not kosher. You don't want to subject anybody in your family to any kind of uh, unsafe practices or violence or any of that. So refer them out and help them to get help as soon as possible because that's the way forward and try to keep our families intact, but at the same time, get them treated so they're well. And uh, please, please uh, uh, call the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center and, you know, let's, let's do this Guam, it's possible. And, uh, you know, Chris and Sabrina, I just so appreciate you guys staying on top of this because it really is important for you to know, for our, for our families and our, our community to know, you know, it's like, let's, let's do whatever we can to help support them, but to support them in the way in which, you know, we can get them off the streets and have them treated for whatever, <clears throat> whatever's going on with them. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, you for all the work you're doing as well. Thank you. All right. There you go. Oh, you too. There you go. Might be the first time I blew a kiss on the link. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that works on Zoom, too. Yeah, it does. 757. I'll send her friends last year. Yeah, I don't know. It'd be you know what, you want to continue to the guy. affection? Or <laughs> <laughs> but let's what? Keep it no in the cannabis conversations? <laughs> keep it in uh, the KUM in the Zoom room. Senator Frank Blas, Jr. Uh,